This is Dr. Bess Miller, and I'm here with Dr. William Fagey. Today's date is August 26, 2016, and we are in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I am interviewing Dr. Fagey as part of the oral history project, The Early Years of AIDS, CDC's response to a historic epidemic. We are here to discuss your experience and reflections on the early years of CDC's work on what would become known as AIDS. I must ask, Dr. Fagey, do I have your permission to interview you and to record this interview? You do. Thank you. Dr. Fagey, I have known and admired you since I first came to CDC as an EIS officer in 1981 when you were director of CDC. Your work in public health before and since is, of course, legendary. It includes playing a lead role in the global smallpox eradication campaign conducted during the late 1960s and 1970s, which led to the global eradication of smallpox in 1980. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, you were director of CDC during both the Carter administration and into the first part of the Reagan administration when AIDS emerged. And in the late 1990s and 2000s, you have worked with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to expand its global health mission, which has transformed the global fight against many diseases of poverty. In recognition of your achievements in international public health, President Obama awarded you the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2012. I must also note here that according to many, and most recently an online article entitled Profile of a Global Health Prankster, Bill Fagey, written by Tom Paulson on June 3, 2014 in Humanosphere, there is a mischievous side to you which we'll want to hear more about. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that this oral history of AIDS at CDC was the idea of the late Dr. David Sensor former CDC director, and I know a good friend and colleague of yours. I was fortunate to work with Dr. Sensor in 1982 when I conducted one of the early AIDS investigations, the so-called lymphadenopathy study in New York, when Dr. Sensor was health commissioner in New York. And I got a chance to appreciate his mischievous side as well. Let's begin with your background. Can you tell us about your childhood and early years? Sure. I grew up in my first 10 years in a small village in northeast Iowa, only 100 people, and a one-room schoolhouse. We moved then to the state of Washington, and I graduated from high school in Colville, Washington, and then went to college in Tacoma at Pacific Lutheran University. It sounds like you moved a bit. Uh, how was that for you? The, uh, my father was a minister, and so he would get calls to different churches. And uh, I think our moves were, by and large, exciting moves. We kept going to bigger and bigger places, which you almost have to do if you start out in a village of 100 people. Why did you go to college where you did? How did that come about? It, because they had a clergy discount. <laughs> <laughs> and so my siblings went there also, and it turned out to be a very good liberal arts college with a good record of sending students to medical school at the University of Washington. There was one person at the school by name of Bill Strunk who was so well regarded at the medical school that if he recommended you, you had a good chance of being admitted. What inspired you to go to medical school? I think a number of things. When I was 15, I had a hip injury and was put in a body cast. This was before television in our town, so I was reduced to reading. <laughs> and in reading, I came across the works of Albert Schweitzer. And his book, Out of My Life and Thought, was the first one that I read. But I gradually became interested in the idea of Africa and medicine. Then an older sister went to medical school, and so that was an inspiration to me because not very many women went to medical school in those days. And so I used to visit her on weekends at medical school and, and found it to be a very exciting environment. 
So you went to medical school, and when did you begin to do international work with respect to that? In medical school, I was already interested in what we now call global health, but you could not find people on the faculty that were interested, with a couple of exceptions. One was Ray Ravenholt, who had been an EIS officer at CDC. So he thought in public health terms, but he also thought in global terms. Uh, terms. And he told me, if you're really interested in global health, you should try to get into the EIS. And it was good advice because there were not many tracks into global health at that time. Anyone that went into global health pretty much did this on their own. They, they uh, created their own path. And he said the EIS program would be one way to get in. Mm. And it turned out to be one of the best ways to get into global health. Hmm. So those were the years of Alex Langmuir, and what did you end up doing in the EIS? I was um, assigned to the state of Colorado, and it was an assignment that I wanted because I wanted sort of a broad look at, uh, at public health. But while I was there, I was called one day because of a suspected case of smallpox in Farmington, New Mexico in a Navajo child. And the instructions I got from D.A. Henderson and from Don Millar, get a book by Dixon on smallpox and read as much as you can before you catch the plane tonight. So my problem was finding that book because a medical student had checked it out in order to write a paper. <laughs> I had to find the medical student, I did, but to talk him out of the book was somewhat harder because he had a paper to write. It was interesting that I felt pretty confident in being able to distinguish between smallpox and chickenpox by the time I got off that plane, mm. only to have a car come right to the plane to pick me up and take me to the hospital because people were waiting for the outside expert. Mm. I walked into the uh, room where this child was hospitalized and as I walked in and looked at the child in bed, I knew immediately that I didn't know what that child had. <laughs> I mean, it was sobering. So I took my time doing a history and physical, then went into a back room and called D.A. Henderson and Don Millar. Both of them were at a party here in Atlanta, and we went through everything I had found and concluded you can't rule out smallpox on the basis of this. And so we called it a suspected smallpox case until we could rule it out. Believe it or not, the specimens that we sent in that night to CDC constituted one of only two errors that I know of in smallpox diagnosis at CDC. And the error was not an uh, absolute error. They said it was compatible with smallpox. And so for the next three or four days, of course, we had to treat it as if it was smallpox. When the answer came back, it was herpes. But this was in a child just recovering from measles with a background rash, disseminated herpes with a different kind of rash, severe thrush so that you had trouble seeing the inside of the mouth of the child. And you can see why it was so confusing to the pediatricians. And then we got the answer back that it was herpes. But it interested me in smallpox. And the next year, as part of my EIS training, I went to India for three months as a substitute Peace Corps physician. And at that time, I saw real smallpox in hospitals and uh, realized what a terrible d disease this really is. That's fascinating. Now, what role did D.A. Henderson and Don Millar have? Were they the, at that point? Were they at CDC heading up different parts of the organization? Don Millar at that time was one year ahead of me in EIS and had already developed an interest in smallpox and some of the outbreaks in Europe. D.A. Henderson was head of surveillance, and so he was our overall uh, supervisor. And it was during those years that we first had the conversations on smallpox eradication. After EIS, I went to Harvard for a master's degree in tropical public health with uh, Tom Weller. Tom Weller was a Nobel laureate for having grown the polio virus and making polio vaccine uh, possible. 
And in one of his seminars, I did a seminar on the possibility of smallpox eradication. I had no intent of being involved in smallpox at that time. It was an academic exercise. But he questioned me with such detail that it put me off. I was actually uh, somewhat frightened until afterwards when one of his faculty uh, colleagues said to me, he never embarrasses a student. When he questions like that, it's because he's so interested he cannot help himself. And uh, so I found that the idea of smallpox eradication had academic uh, legitimacy also. I then went off to run a medical center in Nigeria and got a letter from DA asking if I would be a consultant as they were starting a smallpox eradication program in 20 countries of West and Central Africa. What were, um, what were some of the key aspects of smallpox at that time that inspired people to want to embark on eradication in the, those very early years and discussions? Smallpox was a different disease in that we had a good vaccine. And we had had the vaccine actually since 1796, but we hadn't exploited it. But it was a disease that if a person gets it, you know, because it's visible on the hands and the, and the feet and on the face. There are very few, if any, cases that are subclinical. So you can do surveillance based on finding people that have lesions. Also, the vaccine protected probably for life, but certainly two vaccinations protected uh, for life. And so it was easy even afterwards to know where smallpox had been because of the scars of people. If you didn't find, if you found scars, for instance, in people under the age of three, you knew there'd been an outbreak there within the last three years. So the disease had many things going for it. Mm -hmm. And after eradication, people would often say in meetings at WHO, if you mentioned a lesson from smallpox, they would say, oh, but smallpox eradication was easy. Mm -hmm. And that meant they hadn't actually been involved in it. It had some things going for it, but it was never easy. You ended up having a, a leadership role in the smallpox campaign for over a decade, working in a number of countries, and especially, as you mentioned, Nigeria and India. For this interview, I'd like to ask you about the big lessons learned from this massive effort. Can you share some reflections on that? I like to tell students that some of the lessons of smallpox eradication include the fact this is a cause and effect world. It's not a magic world. If you can figure out what is causing something, then perhaps you can intervene. It's also a world where you can collect facts, and epidemiology turned out to be the base science, of course, of public health, because you were looking for numerators and denominators and as Alex Langmer used to say, it's so simple, you come up with a rate and then you interpret the rate. It's not all that simple because you have to get the right numerators and the right denominators. Can you say more what you mean for the viewer uh, about numerators and denominators? When a person goes to see a physician, that physician is dealing with a numerator, a person who has some problem that they want advice on. But that physician does not see the rest of the population that did not come into the physician's office. That's the denominator, that's everybody. And to get a rate, you have to know how many people are in the numerator. So if you wanna know how much smallpox there is in an area, you have to know how many cases there are and then what's the population. And so then you can tell the difference between the rate of smallpox in India versus in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And it's quite different. So you can measure social justice through epidemiology by looking at rates and comparing people. So one of the lessons is to find the truth, and you find the truth by collecting the right information. Sometimes you don't even want to know the truth. It's so overwhelming. In October of 1973, we did our first major search for smallpox in India. I was so naive that I wrote in the instructions, we won't find much smallpox because it's the low point of the season for transmission, but we will find out how to find smallpox. I was 
absolutely wrong. Six days later, the searchers had found 10,000 new cases of smallpox that we did not know about. And yet you have to know the truth if you're going to do anything about that. So finding the truth is absolutely important. Then nothing is done without a coalition. None of us do anything alone. And so you ask the question, what's the difference between coalitions that are really exceptional and ones that are just average? And it turns out that the exceptional ones, everyone has agreed to the last mile before they start. So you don't just get together because you're the same religious uh, orientation or the same political philosophy. You get together in order to accomplish some last mile. And if you've signed on for that, this can be a successful coalition. But it also requires leadership in the coalition willing to give up their ego, that you get your satisfaction from the output of the group rather than getting turf as an individual. It also turns out you need leadership that can do both executive leadership and congressional leadership. That is, sometimes you have to make a decision, sometimes you have to get the opinion of everybody before you make that decision. So those are some of the lessons. Uh, but Was it hard? How, what part of that was easy for you and what part was hard? What, was it hard letting go of your own ego and getting to the group or, or were, were the congressional discussions more fun for you or more difficult? I did not find the mechanics of the coalitions that difficult because once you got people to agree to smallpox eradication as the goal, then a lot of these other things just fall uh, into place. The science in many ways was easy. If you didn't know the answer to something, you figured out how to get the answer. What always turns out to be hard, and this was not only in smallpox but at CDC, uh, politics and personnel. Personnel problems can just ru ruin your day. Political problems can ruin your day. And yet every public health decision is based on a political decision. And if I have regrets, and I do, one of them is that I didn't learn how to operate politically early enough. Because public health people tend to think if we do the right thing, Everyone is going to understand and they'll support it and they'll fund it. It's not true. You have to learn how to deal with politicians and give them satisfaction in achieving the outcome of a coalition. They are part of the coalition. And we're totally dependent in public health on appropriations from politicians. And so having the political parties involved just turns out to be absolutely crucial. <laughs> That's so true. And, um, let's turn now to your role as director of CDC, and this was from 1977 to 1983. You were instrumental in a major reorganization of CDC, and can you tell us a little bit about the motivation for this reorganization and describe the early years of this reorganization and some of the challenges? The CDC reorganization was based on really two things. We started out at CDC as a communicable disease center. And so infectious diseases were the things we worked on. Public health was gradually enlarging to include chronic diseases, occupational diseases, environmental problems, injuries. And we had to be ready to move into that uh, area. The second thing is that uh, Management consultants that had come to CDC said this is a great place, but it's still a mom and pop operation. And you saw that with every outbreak that we had to come up with matrix management because you had to get the, the epidemiologists and the laboratorians somehow working together on this outbreak. We always succeeded in doing it, but it wasn't always the most efficient thing. And so as we were trying to figure out how to solve that problem and to expand, we went through a series of steps that I'm really quite proud of now. We sent letters to hundreds of people and asks, uh, asked them, what do you think CDC should be doing? What priorities should it have? We then had an outside group 
that we ended up calling the Red Book Committee because that was the color of their report. They were outsiders. The only exception was Don Millar, who was on the committee so that there would always be someone on the committee that could tap resources in CDC to answer questions. And these people really did get into their work. It's because of that group that we now talk about premature mortality, because they found that they couldn't actually compare mortality uh, for infants versus for old people if they're all the same, they count as one. So this was a scientific group of people? It, it was not. It included, uh, for instance, Betty Bumpers, the wife of Senator Bumpers from Arkansas. Mm -hmm. It included some scientific people, but it was a cross-section mm -hmm. trying to figure out what CDC should be doing. Because they asked that question on it, not every death is the same, we came up with the idea of premature mortality. Then the question was, what do you use as your cutoff? Well, th there's an argument that could be made of median age of death, but then you'd have to change the equation every year. So then people said, use 65 as a cutoff, deaths before 65. And other people said, yes, but 75 is closer. But then we stayed at 65 because most of the world had statistics on under 65 and over 65. So that's how the premature death uh, reports use 65. At any rate, this group came up with 12 priorities that they thought CDC should always uh, be thinking about before appropriations. We then had two retreats at Berry College of the top management at CDC to go over what this Red Book Committee had said and what other people were saying to ask, what can we agree on? And, and I'm keep so curious to hear about that because it was mom and pop and there were people that had very emotional feelings about their turf. How, how did that work then? Well, when this group met at Barry, we came up with 15 priorities, three more than the Red Book Committee. And our agreement was we'll go through all 15 of these before appropriations, our submission to appropriations, to be sure we've done right by them. Now we ask the question, how should we be organized to do right? And the decision was we would have different centers, each one with all of the specialties that they needed. So we would have a center for infectious diseases that included statisticians, epidemiologists, laboratorians. We would do the same for occupational health, environmental health, and this then would mean if people went out on an outbreak, they didn't have to come up with matrix management. They had the specialties right there in their center. Now here's the problem. When we talked about a center for infectious diseases, the laboratorians immediately objected. They did not want an epidemiologist heading up that center. They thought they would be marginalized if that happened. And so I worried about this and worried about this. I finally went to a laboratorian who had the respect of people in the lab and the epidemiologist, Walt Doddle. He had worked with the epidemiologist every year on trying to figure out what should be in the flu vaccine so they knew him well, and he turned me down. So I did not like to try to talk people into positions, but I went back to him a second time, and he turned me down. I went back a third time and he said he would try it. And it turned out to be the solution because those laboratorians had already put their CVs out on the street. They were looking for positions at universities. They were not going to remain if an epidemiologist headed up. I knew the first head of the Infectious Disease Center would be the crucial one. After that, you could choose anyone because now you have a group of people that have worked together. And that's exactly mm. what happened. Walt made this thing work and it worked so well, it didn't actually matter what the specialty was of the next person. That's a great story. So it, CDC got uh, reorganized with relatively little trauma, and uh, I think it was the right organization, the right reorganization. Let's turn now to the early years of AIDS at CDC. Uh, 1981 to 1983, you were still director of CDC. 
So the MMWR on five cases of pneumocystis carinae pneumonia in homosexual men was published on June 5, 1981. What was the initial thinking about this disease at the highest level of the agency? And what was your response in terms of mobilizing a response? We were absolutely bewildered by those first cases. And once the MMWR went out, suddenly we found there were many more cases. Uh, New York and Los Angeles and Miami and San Francisco all had cases, but they hadn't put this together that this was a new problem until that MMWR article. Yes, we were bewildered and we were soon overwhelmed. One of the heroes in this story is Paul Wiesner, who immediately put people from the uh, STD program, the Sexually Transmitted Disease Program, on the investigation. So he wasted no time in responding to this. I think two of the other heroes turned out to be Jim Curran and Harold Jaffe, who headed up then the uh, AIDS program. And we put this in the front office when we realized how big this was so that we could be sure to provide as much support as was possible from the front office. These people were exceptional. I mean, uh, I look back at the things we did right and getting the right people turned out to be one of the things. Harold Jaffe is unflappable. And as big as this problem became, uh, he was able to contain his emotions and just keep working scientifically. Jim Kern had the ability to ingratiate himself with groups. For instance, the researchers, he soon learned the language. The clinicians, he already knew uh, the language. He was able to get with the gay community and eventually be trusted. They didn't trust government. And Jim somehow was able to work in the most difficult situations and become believable, and CDC was well served by them. But then we kept learning new things, I mean, every day. This, the first idea that this is in gay men turned out to be true. For all of the work we had done on STDs at CDC, I think most people were taken by surprise on the sex practices of gay men. It took a while for this to be understood, but eventually CDC did understand what were the risk factors in sex between men. And this was published in the MMWR. I was also so proud by the science work that was done so that by March 4, 1983, less than two years after the first cases had been reported, the MMWR was able to provide an article on prevention of AIDS that is so good you can still use it today. And this was before we knew there was a virus. So this, this is work we should look back on and understand the power of epidemiology to define something even before the science can define it. Then we had this odd uh, Kaposi's sarcoma. It was understandable with the first diseases that these were diseases you saw with uh, immune systems that were not working properly. But Kaposi's sarcoma was a cancer from, that we saw a lot of in Africa, rarely in the United States. What was the basis of this? Well, Jim Curran got a Kaposi's group together, people around the world that have worked with this disease. And as an aside, let me just mention the first day that they met. I welcomed them, but I used the pronunciation that I had learned in medical school, which was Kaposi's sarcoma. And after welcoming them and thanking them for their service and so forth, one of the people said, we should start by getting the pronunciation correct. And he said, it's actually Kaposi's. But then he added, but that's not the way Dr. Kaposi pronounced it. He said he pronounced his own name Kaposi. Mm -hmm. And he said it didn't really matter because that wasn't his name. His name was Cohen, and he changed his name. Now, according to the stories, he changed his name so that he would not be seen as Jewish in trying to get into medical school. But Kaposi himself wrote, 
No, he changed his name because there were already four other Cohens on the faculty, and he knew he was going to be great, and he did not want to be misunderstood as being the wrong Cohen. At any rate, uh, campus East sarcoma was another one of these bewildering things. Fourteen years later, we understood it, when a virus was isolated that is responsible for this condition. And so now you can see, again, it was an altered immune system. But then I can tell you one of the darkest moments was when we realized that people with hemophilia were getting AIDS. We had one case, as I recall from Colorado, where the person had died before being interviewed. So you didn't know whether this person had uh, a problem because of hemophilia or was gay. But then a second case, I think from Florida, as I recall, we had information the person was not gay, and now it was a strong suspicion this came from factor eight. Now, factor eight is something that you get in the blood by pooling plasma from literally hundreds or even thousands of people. And the idea that we might have the virus in that pool, I tell you, was sickening. But we then immediately that day said to ourselves, now we're going to get cases in people who have blood transfusions. And of course, this was true. But one more thing, that we went to a meeting at Mount Sinai. And at this meeting, we knew that there were people who felt this was not a virus. It was due to drugs that gay people were using as part of the sex experience. And so Jim Curran talks about this being a turning point because when we presented the CDC material, both on a case from Los Angeles that had resulted in many cases and you could trace them over space and time and the hemophilia problem, it was clear this was a virus and suddenly it changed the whole meeting. And so then after this meeting, we had the problem of how do you test uh, the plasma for hemophilia? And, you know, this is such a heartbreaking decision because these people cannot live without factor eight, and now they're going to get AIDS from factor eight. But then the same thing with transfusions. How do you screen the blood? And so for blood transfusions, our screening was really on the basis of if you're in a group, and that turned out to be a gaze or uh, people from Haiti because they had a higher risk uh, rate of uh, AIDS at that time. But no one's happy with that because it excludes a lot of people who could be giving blood, but we had no alternative. And I can remember Don Francis from CDC becoming so angry at the blood bank industry because they did not want to really deal with this. Well, just a few months after we published the article on prevention, we had the first article from France of a virus. And now things started to fit into place. But in early 1984, a virologist from CDC came to me and he said that I think the virus isolated by Bob Gallo is actually the French virus. I don't think this is a new virus. So what do you do about that? I went to my boss, Ed Brandt, who was Assistant Secretary for Health, and told him about what I had been told. He said, let me check into this. But he said, don't worry about it. If it turns out to be true, science takes care of these sorts of problems. Well, it took a while for science to take care of that because only months after that, uh, Margaret Heckler, the Secretary, had a press conference with Bob Gallo and Ed Brandt to announce that they had isolated the virus for AIDS mm. and that they would soon have a test for that virus. And in two years, she said, we will have a vaccine. So it took some time uh, until the Nobel Prize was awarded to the French scientists. And uh, so in that case, Ed Brandt was right. Science did eventually take care of this problem. But if I can say a few things about what this meant globally, because in Africa, this turned out to be an even bigger problem than here. 
And I can remember the absolute discouragement that I felt in Africa as young professionals were dying, doctors were dying, uh, church workers were dying, teachers were dying. They were dying faster than they could be replaced. And it brought out several points of AIDS in Africa. It was a heterosexual rather than a homosexual disease in, in Africa. And in Africa, when people were successful enough to be making money, the men ended up with more sexual partners. And as with the U.S., the number of sexual par partners did make a difference in this disease. And so it was spreading rapidly among the educated uh, and rich in Africa. What to do about that? Well, the African leaders tried to pretend it wasn't happening. They were afraid it would hurt tourism and, and uh, with markets and so forth. But in the late 80s, 1987, uh, Seth Berkeley, who had been an EIS officer at CDC, was now working in Uganda for the Task Force for Child Survival. He was there on Rockefeller money to do child survival work, and he sent me a letter saying he had just evaluated what was happening in a prenatal clinic, and he was seeing a rapid increase in HIV positivity in young pregnant women. He asked, is it possible for me to switch and work on this problem rather than child survival? We got the agreement of Rockefeller, and he did. A year later, uh, which would be 1988, President Carter was going to make a visit to Uganda. The president of Uganda, President Museveni, had many people uh, brief him before Carter's visit. He was a man that liked to get his facts correct. Seth Berkeley briefed him on a number of things, but included the histogram or the graph on what was happening to HIV positivity rates in prenatal clinics. Museveni was actually shocked because you could see this increasing month by month. And his remark to Seth Berkeley was, if I know this, everyone should know it. And he started spreading the story and actually published that graph. This was the beginning of leaders in Africa acknowledging mm -hmm. the problems that they were having. Now, if I can skip forward to another episode that involved CDC people, the Merck drug company had, from the 80s, been giving mectazan for river blindness in Africa, and they had given, and in Central America, and they had given this free. And at the Task Force for Child Survival, we were running a program to distribute mectazan. Merck became so pleased with their mectazan program that they called a small group of us, including myself and Jim Curran, and said, we're so pleased with this, is there something similar we could do for AIDS? And our suggestion was, don't just send one more person to Africa to study this and publish a paper, and Africa doesn't benefit. <laughs> Try to figure out what would it take to actually control AIDS in Africa under current conditions, so you don't have to wait for development. Well, it was in maybe November of 1999, that uh, Gil Martin, who was now the CEO of Merck, called us back and showed us a plan that a man by the name of Guy McDonald had put together on what could be done about AIDS in Africa. We became very excited about it. And in January of 2000, we had a meeting in Seattle of six foundations Everything looks so bleak in Africa with AIDS. The question of the meeting, is there any light at the end of the tunnel? What should we be suggesting to our funders? We met for two days, but before the meeting, I told the group that I was inviting Guy McDonald from Merck to present on his plan for Africa. The people were aghast. They said, we don't need someone from a company that makes a profit telling us what to do about AIDS. They're going to try to promote some product of theirs. We actually discussed this for two or three hours and they said, absolutely not. 
Well, I knew he was all, already on the plane heading for Seattle. And finally, after three hours, one person said, I'm going to remove my objections as a favor to Bill Fagey. He must have some reason why he's uh, promoting this. The next day, Guy McDonald reported on his plan, and it was the hit of the meeting. It gave some hope. People became very excited. We came up with six ideas, and everyone was to go back to their foundation to promote these ideas. I was to present these to Bill Gates. And so a few days later, we went to Bill Gates' office at Microsoft, and it could not have started worse. Because as we entered the meeting, he began chewing us out about a grant proposal that we had sent. And he said, I've told you before, I never want to see a proposal like this. It's a bottomless pit. He said, if I fund it today, I have to fund it next year. And as he went through the list of things he never wanted to see again, I realized these were exactly the things I was about to propose. And so I tried to think of some other reason for being there, but couldn't, and I decided I have to go ahead with the proposal. So I told him about the meeting. We came up with six ideas. I wanted him to at least hear them. As I went through the first five, he stopped me and said, wait a minute, how much money are you talking about? And I said, well, from the Gates Foundation, I was hoping for 50 million a year for 10 years. Now that's a half a billion dollars. That's no small ask. And he said, oh, it's gonna take more than that. And all of a sudden, I had the ability to go to number six, orphans in Africa. And I presented our ideas on orphans and he said, you can't worry about AIDS in Africa without worrying about those orphans. In 20 minutes, he told me to do all six things. On the way back from the meeting, I rode with his father, just the two of us, and I asked his father, can you explain to me what just happened? And he said, my son knows business. He wants a return on his investment. He doesn't want to put money down the drain. But when faced with the human condition, he'll try to make the right decision. Now, I think that's the best story that I have out of the Gates Foundation. And what it led to is we did try those six things, but we also hired Helene Gale from CDC, and I told her she could give up her billion dollar budget and hundreds of employees and have one employee and no budget at all, but she could influence the person who could make the biggest difference in the world. So she came to the Gates Foundation. One of the first things we did was a project in Botswana where Merck put in $50 million, the Gates Foundation put in $50 million. And I tell you, that first visit to Botswana, 35% of people were HIV positive. 45% of newborns were HIV positive. It was the most dreary, dreary look at things. I went on rounds at a hospital in North Botswana where no one ever mentioned the word AIDS, and yet you know every patient we were seeing had AIDS. But they called it cancer, they called it malnutrition, they called it all kinds of things, tuberculosis, and often they, it was tuberculosis. We finished, we went to a room, and I asked the head of the medical department, how in the world can you come in here every day? What do you do for your mental health? He stared at me for so long that I worried about what I had asked. And then suddenly tears started rolling down his face. And he said, I've never told anyone this before. But he said, I was born one of four sons. My three brothers have died of AIDS. I don't have a choice. Four years later, we go back to Botswana and the rate of HIV in newborns has dropped from 45% to 4%. I mean, this was a combination of Merck and a foundation and a government and Harvard University, all with a coalition that actually worked. And also a, a result of some of your um, 
authority and power of persuasion. Can you can you talk a little bit more about um, coming to to people to leaders and having an idea, wanting to persuade them? What what goes through your mind? How how do you how do you make things happen like that? Do you listen a lot? Do you what's what's the secret? There's a book by Gary Wills called Certain Trumpets. And the title of the book comes from a Bible verse that says, if you hear an uncertain trumpet, would you gird for battle? And Gary Wills shows that there are all kinds of leaderships. And that oftentimes people think if you're a leader, you're a leader. And he said, no, that isn't true. There are all kinds of leaderships. And he gives examples of different kinds and people that exemplify that, and then people that didn't. And he uses only two living people in his uh, examples. One is Andrew Young, and not because of being the UN ambassador, but how he could bridge the black-white community in the early days of civil rights. The other person he uses is Ross Perot, who he said, was a good business leader, but not a good political leader, that these are different things. But the basic point is, if you want leadership, you have to know some end game that you actually want, and you explain it to other people who want it also, and then they become followers, and suddenly he says, you're the leader. <laughs> so Gary Wills talks about the different kinds of leadership and how they're not all the same, but the p point they have in common is someone defines a, an outcome that they want. And then they talk other people into wanting that same outcome. And once that happens, you've got followers. And if you have followers, it makes you the leader. So he said that's what leadership is about, is defining that last mile and then being able to picture it so other people can see it and they want it also. So with smallpox eradication, it's easy to define the last mile. It's harder to get people to believe that that's possible. I mean, we've had the vaccine since 1796, and smallpox continued on. And in India, they had countless smallpox eradication efforts, and still the disease existed. And in each time that they looked at this, they would set a goal of getting 80% of people vaccinated. Every time when they would evaluate afterwards, they found that people had used vaccine that should have covered 80% of people, but they had taken easy populations and given them two and three and four vaccinations. And so the real coverage was about 50%. So in the 70s, they had their last evaluation, included people from CDC, WHO, from around the world, and again they said, it's not working, and their conclusion was you must raise the 80% to 100%. That makes no logic whatsoever. If you can't make 80%, you're not gonna make 100%. And so that's why it required coming up with an end game where it was not 80% or 100% coverage, it was zero virus. And now you could concentrate on the virus rather than on mass vaccination. What about your personal style? Can you talk a little bit about that? I'm going off the grid here, but it's um, it's so it's been so successful. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about just the art of persuasion or discussion, certainly in international settings, but in in U.S. settings as well. Any, can you point to any things that have worked well that you've honed in on? I, I'm not sure that I have a personal style. I don't, if I do, I don't know what it is. I do know that I enjoy learning things and that I learn many of these things from people telling me. And so I enjoy talking to people. And even today, if I get into a taxi I enjoy finding out who this person is that's driving the car and where are they from. 
and why are they here and are they enjoying it here? And uh, you wouldn't believe how often, in fact, I would say almost uh, always, I can come up with someone that we know uh, in common. And one of the most uh, interesting ones was in Washington, D.C., when the driver was from Nigeria. And I try to guess before I ask them where they're from. And sometimes I actually can hit the actual town. But this person was from Enugu, Nigeria. And so I told him that I had lived there once. And he wanted to know where. And I described the Abakaliki Road and the soccer field and he knew where the fire station was, and he finally got around. He understood which flat I lived in, mm. and he pulled the car over to the side of the road. He was so excited, and he turned around, and he said, I used to steal mangoes from your yard. <laughs> so I, I enjoy finding out about people, and I think that this helps in negotiation. Another example. Uh, if you have worked in smallpox eradication and you run into anyone in the world that worked in smallpox eradication, you immediately have a rapport. After I returned to CDC, I went to India once as the American chair for a science delegation. And the Indian chair was Dr. Ramalinga Swami, who I'd known for years, but USAID asked me if I would stay for a week after the meeting because they had a problem with a program they were trying to get approved by India. So after the meeting, I went into USAID. They showed me what the program was, who had it at the Ministry of Health, and I went over to see the person. We immediately recognized each other from the smallpox days. And so we talked for 45 minutes about our experiences in smallpox. And then he asked what I was there for, and I told him about this USAID program. And yes, he had it on his shelf, and uh, he just uh, had held it for months. But he signed it right there. I went back to USAID three hours after I had left them with a signed document. And see, there was nothing special about that. It was that he and I had shared an experience, and part of a coalition, the thing that holds a coalition together is trust. And so we already have a trust relationship. I didn't even have to talk about the document they wanted signing. He was willing to sign it because he trusted me. So uh, I, I think that's, it's, it comes down to personal relationships. Let's talk about one or two aspects of the political side going back to AIDS. Um, during those first years, as there was a dramatic increase in cases and a, a very high case fatality rate, as you've mentioned, can you tell us about some of your efforts to draw the federal government attention to this disease and to get funding to address it? There's often the question of the political environment at the beginning of AIDS, and there's no question that it was pretty negative, that there were difficulties with the White House even wanting to talk about AIDS. They didn't want to talk about it, but they got to a point where everything we put out from CDC had to be approved by the White House. But mm. I find myself not wanting to blame politics for any of the things we did wrong in AIDS, because I think that we did a lot of things right. We did some things wrong, and we had uh, we had some favorable people in the administration. Ed Brandt was the Assistant Secretary for Health. He had a medical degree. He had a PhD in, in biostatistics. Mm -hmm. And so you didn't ever try to fool him on statistics. He had a theology degree. And he was a person trying to do the right thing. And so we could rely on him to convey the science of AIDS. Then we had uh, Dr. Koop, who came in with the religious community, believing he would always support them. But he was a scientist, and he listened to the facts. And he became one of the strongest supporters of AIDS 
in the Reagan administration. So it's not as if it was a total wasteland that we couldn't penetrate. There were good people uh, trying to do it. So if there were problems, uh, I think that we have to take responsibility for them. This is something I learned from Bill Watson, who was director of, uh, deputy director of CDC. I used to become so upset about political decisions that hurt public health. And one day he said to me, well, it's probably your fault. I said, what do you mean? He said, if you had anticipated the information they needed before making that decision, they wouldn't have made that decision. And so I got to a second step in my evolution of we've got to try to incorporate politicians, let them feel some of the successes, give them the information. But I can tell you that is so labor intensive mm -hmm. because politicians keep turning over. Mm -hmm. So then I went through to the third step, which is trying to talk public health people into going into politics. And I continue to do that all the time because if we have public health people in politics, you don't have to do this kind of training. They understand immediately what the implications are. So yes, there were uh, political problems. Now, I think the PEPFAR program is where politics came and benefited us. And I think this is a lasting legacy of George W. Bush is the PEPFAR program and what this has done. I have se several problems with it. One, we all believe that treatment was going to lead to better prevention. And instead what it did is it led to better treatment but we still didn't use that for prevention. The other thing, I resented how the religious community was able to use the idea of abstinence, uh, the uh, delay of sex, but no condoms. Mm -hmm. And this message really became very important. I was in Seattle when the head of PEPFAR came to give a talk and I went to listen and I was very taken by his uh, grasp of management, understanding of the problem, but he was very strict in abstinence, no premarital sex or extramarital sex, and no condoms. And there was no give on his part. And then it took me by surprise when he stepped down and I realized only days later, he stepped down because his name was on the madam's list in Washington, D.C. Well, so this idea of abstinence and no extramarital sex, he wasn't listening to at all. And I hope he didn't listen to the third message of no condoms. I remember that well. Going back and, and pushing just a little bit more on the climate in Washington in the early 80s, I think you know there was a huge outcry from the marginalized populations, mostly gay men at that time, but certainly drug users were marginalized. And some claim because of this thousands, perhaps 10,000s of lives were lost. Can you say a little bit more about specific meetings you might have been at or conversations you were a part of? Um, I recently just watched a, a program on the history of Ronald Reagan's presidency, two programs that were fascinating. Um, can you say any more about that? It was a time of great change in the country, so what was your, your take at that time? It's interesting how we forget the details. And recently when Nancy Reagan died and Hillary Clinton talked about how she uh, was such a supporter of mm -hmm. work in AIDS. And that was totally untrue, but that's the way she remembered it, or she wouldn't have, have uh, said it. But uh, in those early months of the Reagan administration, I went to uh, the World Health Assembly as a U.S. delegate. Uh, Coop had already been nominated, but not approved. So he was there, but could not go in official capacity. Mm. He, was, he was there to learn. And one of the big issues was infant formula. And infant formula was a problem because it was being promoted by the infant formula companies in developing areas. Mm 
And when mothers use this, they often use contaminated water. And so these children were getting sick because of the infant formula, while if they had been breastfed for the first six months, they would have been protected during that period of time. And the World Health Assembly was voting on whether the uh, infant formula manufacturers should be able to promote this in hospitals in the developing world or not. The vote was going to be very lopsided against the manufacturers, except the U.S. got word from that we had to vote for the manufacturers. I objected and said we could at least abstain. It's, we're going to be the only country voting in favor of giving infant formula to children in developing countries. And uh, the White House ruled that the U.S. had to vote uh, against the, the resolution. Now, that just made us look bad, look bad scientifically, politically, and in every way. So that was the atmosphere early on. I think part of what changed it, though, was having COOP not only approved, but uh, uh, being able to become his own person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When he came to uh, Atlanta, uh, he and I uh, talked, just the two of us. And Coop told me later, this was the meeting he dreaded the most on becoming Surgeon General, was coming to CDC because the religious right had been accusing CDC of doing abortions, and Coop was assigned the job of getting us to stop. And so he came to my office, the two of us went in, we closed the door, we sat down, and I said, Dr. Coop, no matter what we talk about, we will both wonder, when will abortion come up? Why don't we talk about that first and get it out of the way? And I explained what we did on surveillance of what are the, what's the morbidity and the mortality from legal and illegal abortions, and that CDC isn't involved in abortions at all. When I finished, he said, if you weren't doing that, I would have to start it because we need to know what the risk is. He said, how could I help you? And I said, well, every time we put out a report, I get hate mail. And I said, would you be willing to look at the reports in draft form and let us know if something is scientifically incorrect or if we're using a word that's a flag. And he agreed to do that, and the word went out that he was doing that, and the hate mail stopped. Now, see, that's how reasonable he was. And so there were times okay. when they could change things. But in, in truth, the environment was very difficult, and it's, uh, it became, for me, uh, the most difficult when it came to Rye syndrome, where we had now three studies that all showed aspirin given to children with flu uh, can lead to Rye syndrome. But none of the studies individually came up to statistical significance. What do you do with that? Well, we didn't know in those days how to aggregate studies. And so uh, uh, the, we went to the uh, Academy of Pediatrics and to others, and we all agreed we don't know exactly how to approach this, but everyone should know what we know. And so mm -hmm. we decided to put this out. Mm -hmm. The aspirin manufacturers were so clever in the way they attacked everything. They would call me at home and say, it would be a shame if you ruin CDC's scientific reputation by putting something out that has not reached statistical significance. Now, why they would do this, I, I don't understand. It can't help them in the long run if it's true. But they even called me at my parents' place at Christmas time. Uh, at any rate, we reached a day when we were going to put it in the MMWR with the FDA. The night before, the FDA called me and they said, the aspirin manufacturers have brought in new information and we're going to have to examine it before we sign on. And so everyone thought we would delay publishing it. I went to CDC the next morning and did not tell anyone about the phone call. Mm. And so the MMWR went out. Mm. And it took everybody by surprise. Mm. The aspirin manufacturers went to Ed Brandt, 
Uh -huh. and he supported us. Oh, good. The Aspirin manufacturers then went to Richard Schweiker, the secretary uh -huh. of HHS. He supported us. They then went to the Reagan White House, and we were told to cease and desist and say nothing more about this and to start a new study. And I said, okay, because the word was already out. You can't stop it. <laughs> and so we started a new study. Walt Doddle was in charge of keeping track of the figures as they came in. He stopped the study in the preliminary phases because it was so clear that this was true. But once again, that was the Reagan White House uh, trying to, to control public health. So public health needs the politicians, but the public health has to be very clear about not caving into politicians. And I'm, I'm so happy about so many things we did, the science is over. I'm less happy and I'm, I feel concerned that we did not always stand up to the politicians or to the religious community. I mean, this idea of not using condoms, uh, we should not ha have been willing to even listen to them on that. A couple of thoughts now, uh, just as we're getting towards um, the end. Um, you mean the end of the interview? The no, end of the interview. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to be sure you didn't have information I didn't do. <laughs> what are your insights now as to about how CDC approached the AIDS epidemic? What did, what did we do best and what could we have done better? Science was the best. I mean, I look at every step of that and I come back uh, thinking how fortunate we were to get the right people uh, working on the science. What could we have done better? You know, uh, we didn't understand uh, the kind of backlash we would get from the gay community. We didn't understand the problems we would have between the gay community and the black community when it came. Uh, to AIDS. And I'm reminded over and over that when you tangle with culture, culture always wins. We, we, <laughs> and it, it was AIDS that finally changed the EIS applicants to include anthropologists and, and everyone else, sociologists and so forth, rather than sticking to uh, MDs, veterinarians, statisticians, and, and so forth. And so we needed this sort of insight into culture, but we weren't forced to get it until AIDS, AIDS forced us into it. Mm. Certainly very true in, in Africa. Just as the global eradication of smallpox was a watershed moment for public health globally, in many ways the AIDS epidemic has been a turning point for public health globally and for CDC as well. Can you comment on the historical significance of the AIDS epidemic on CDC? You've already mentioned several things in terms of uh, getting more social scientists at CDC, um, but and more on the significance of the AIDS epidemic on global public health. I think the AIDS epidemic took everyone by such complete surprise, not only by the size of the outbreak, not only by the speed of the spread, not only by the length of the incubation period. I mean, everything about it was different than we had expected in, in our past experience. And it's been um, sobering that our science has not been good enough to develop a vaccine. But it's also been a watershed in, uh, in other ways. I think uh, it was so difficult to get other countries to develop EIS programs. Canada was the first one, and then Thailand with uh, David Branley and Bennett. And now, what do we have, 80 countries that have EIS programs? I think AIDS has speeded that up. I think it has changed our uh, mindset on we're all in this together. Uh, even with smallpox, while we use those words, I don't think Americans felt vulnerable to smallpox, certainly not to guinea worm, mm -hmm. uh, certainly not to river blindness and mm -hmm. some, but AIDS, we understood it when we said we're all in this 
uh, together. The problems were somewhat different. I think it's also uh, made us more conscious, uh, I mentioned of some of the cultural things. See, I think the basic bottom line problem with AIDS in Africa is that women have no power. And if you look at what happens in Africa, you think they do because you see them doing the marketing, you see them doing the agricultural work, providing for children, getting them off to school. It, that tells us who does the work. It doesn't tell us who has the power. And women have uh, an absence of power. They cannot even control their sex lives. And now we know that. And I think it changes how we feel about what does it mean, what does development mean mm. in, in, in Africa. Um, mm. Then this whole idea of going into treatment for the poorest people in the world, uh, and that's what PEPFAR allowed us to do. Before that, we always assumed, oh, these countries are too poor to do treatment, but we'll try to do uh, pr prevention. So it's changed the playing field a little bit in terms of, of treatment. We still have a long ways uh, to go on that. I think um, it's changed the world in terms of how we bring coalitions together. I'll give you one example. When the Rockefeller Foundation decided the answer to AIDS was a vaccine, they started something called IAVI, which was a vaccine uh, initiative, and they made Seth Berkeley the head of that. Mm -hmm. They put $10 million into it. Then the Gates Foundation put $100 million into IAVI. And at first, Rockefeller uh, was concerned that they're outbidding us. And I kept saying to Rockefeller, no, they're following you. <laughs> that they have such, you have such credibility that if you've decided to do this, they've decided they want to support it. Then people worried about, well, if Gates puts in that much money, other money will dry up, and we won't have government money going to NIH for AIDS vaccine. So someone at NIH who always told me that you can tell this story, but I will deny it. <laughs> He said they had a meeting at NIH when Gates gave that $100 million. And the meeting said, we can't really afford to have an outside group come up with a vaccine. What does NIH have to do to be the one to develop the vaccine? And they came up with a new plan calling for more resources, more people. And so this increased the amount of research everyone's doing. We're going to break that conundrum at some point and come up with a vaccine. I absolutely believe this, but it shows how difficult it is scientific. So AIDS has changed the kind of research that we do and how we're working together and outside forces getting into uh, to research. And it's certainly changed uh, public health in Africa. I mean, the fact that it's bouncing back now able to do things that it couldn't do before. I really thought we had lost a lot um, in, in the early 2000s when people were dying so fast. Coalitions are kind of messy. It sounds like you're okay with messy. Are, are you, um, or can you talk at all about that? <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, non-coalitions are pretty messy. I mean, even CDC. Uh, WHO was pretty messy, and UNICEF. And one of my conclusions from the Task Force for Child Survival is we need those groups. If we didn't have WHO, we would have to develop WHO. But it's not good enough by itself. And when you have a task force that f follows different rules, they're able to make WHO even stronger. And so the original task force was looking at immunization. WHO had a program of immunization, and they now had achieved 15% or so coverage of children. They weren't satisfied with it. I mean, Rafe Henderson, formerly of CDC, was head of the program, and I tell you, this man was working his heart out. 
and he was not satisfied with how slow it was going. UNICEF was not satisfied. And it was the head of UNICEF, Jim Grant, the head of WHO, Hofton Mahler, who came to me separately and said, we each have such a big ego that we sometimes have trouble getting along. You can imagine what it's like for our organizations. We both go into a country saying we want immunization, and then we fight with each other for turf. And what we need is someone that can bring us together. So they said they would like a task force, but with certain rules. They said, you will never try to get a bigger silhouette than we have, and you will never use the word coordinate. <laughs> because no one in our organizations will agree to be coordinated. And so we use the word facilitate. But here's the point. Immunization went from 20% to 80% in six years. Mm. And it showed what could happen when you took these big organizations, UNICEF and WHO, and had a way of facilitating what they were doing with UNDP and the World Bank and with the Rockefeller Foundation, with ministries of health. So, uh, these coalitions turn out to be important in order to grease the wheels, to get the organizations to do what they should. Because the organizations have rules. As an example, uh, March 1988, we had a meeting in Telwar, France on polio. And the people at the meeting included UNICEF and WHO and so forth. We came to the conclusion polio eradication should be pursued. But if we came out with a proclamation from that meeting, each of those organizations would have to approve it, which would take months. <laughs> and so instead, the task force put out that statement, and the world assumed the organizations had approved it because they're the ones that were sponsoring the task force. And two months later, the ministers of health of the countries that had met went to the World Health Assembly and passed a resolution for polio eradication. So that could not have happened without the task force and Rotary and others from the outside making it happen. Inside, there were reasons why WHO wanted this. Dr. Dr. Nakajima had just been approved as the new director and everyone knew he was not actually interested in health. Mm. And so he would not pursue polio and so even though Hofton Mahler was afraid WHO was not ready for polio eradication, Rafe Henderson was afraid of the same thing. They both agreed to this because they said it has to be fixed before Nakajima comes on board. So you see, they had their problems internally. An outside group pushed it, made it happen. Mm. So coalitions are messy and uh, sometimes uh, they provide an avenue that the organizations can't find themselves. Finally, uh, in other in other presentations, you've you've talked about the politicization the politicization of public health. Can you comment on that with respect to the AIDS epidemic in the U.S. and globally? We've taught we've touched on it, I think, as you've been speaking. Well, we can see originally how the politics impeded the science. And then the interesting thing as things turn around and the politics helped the science with PEPFAR, who would have ever believed Jesse Helms was going to vote in favor of funds for AIDS globally? Jesse Helms was such an opponent of all of that. Now. It's unclear to me why he changed, although one of his staff members said he was a very religious person and he saw how old he was and he believed he was going to see Jesus and he wanted to change his image before that happened. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe I don't even care why he changed. It's helping everybody. And, uh, I can't judge whether he's going to see Jesus or not. I'm going to stay out of that. <laughs> but you see how the politics then ended up helping. Well, over and over, politics has helped. I remember once when uh, someone from Dale Bumper's office called 
and said, here's the problem with CDC being in Atlanta. If you were in Washington and you could have a letter here tomorrow morning with your signature saying you need $6 million for polio, we could get it for you tomorrow morning. But being in Atlanta, we can't. And I said, don't be so sure. And the next morning they had that letter. And you see how politics then helped us with the immunization program. Uh, and uh, it's, to me, it's never been a problem that we're 600 miles away from the politicians. This <laughs> has always been an asset. And, uh, uh, and yet we need the politicians and we have to figure out how to make them part of the coalition so that they get rewarded when that last mile is, is, is achieved. You know, it was politics that actually gave us our, uh, our public immunization system in this country. It was April 1955 when uh, Tommy Francis announced that the polio vaccine worked at the University of Michigan. And the secretary of HEW, Mrs. Hobby from Texas, had come to Washington saying she will have no part of socialized medicine. She was gonna do everything she could to stop it. Now, a vaccine works and the public was absolutely ecstatic. And the question was, okay, what's the government gonna do? And she was inundated suddenly with questions on this. And Eisenhower said to her, you're going to have a program for polio vaccine. So she had a, press conference. She announced that she was going to seek an appropriation to buy vaccine for poor children. And you know what happened? A senator, I mean, it's all politics. Lester Hills then had a press conference. And in essence, what he said is over my dead body. No <laughs> American child will ever have to declare themselves poor in order to be protected. I will seek an appropriation to cover all American children. And that was the beginning of the Public Vaccine Act in this country. And look what it's led to. Because it said in that one statement that this vaccine is not just for personal protection, it's for the protection of the entire public. And we've maintained that to the present time. 10 years later, Lyndon Johnson used the same argument for why the US got into the smallpox program when we didn't have any smallpox here. We're all in this together. Mm, so. That's right. Thank you so much, Dr. Fagey. No, uh, thank you. Really appreciate it.